in today's show. We're talking with Adam King. We've got questions that you guys have sent through. We're going to talk about one of his favorite players. We're going to discuss a mock draft that we did yesterday, some trends we're seeing there. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Going to have a lot of shows coming out in the next couple of days. We have got this one here with Kingy. I've got a show on second year players coming out later today. Going to have point guard and shooting guard tiers with Matt Smith tomorrow. And there's going to there's going to be a mock draft tomorrow as well. 12-team points league. And if you want in that 12-team points league mock draft, there's a link in the YouTube video in the comments. I've dropped a link. Join it. It will be at 6 p.m. Eastern, American Eastern, on Wednesday, the 7th of September. For you Aussies, that's 8 a.m., on Thursday, the 8th of September. So join it. If you're not there with 10 minutes to go before the draft starts, I'm going to kick your ass out. Simple as that. A 12-team standard points league draft on Yahoo. Join the mock draft if you want. The link is going to be in the comments below. We're going to talk to Kingy today. I've got a few questions to go through. So, Warney. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring him in. Here he is. Adam King, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Josh. Good to be here. I, I only saw you a week ago or two weeks ago, whatever, whatever it was. And, and my wife's actually down in Melbourne today and, and said that it's forecast to be a balmy 20 degrees. So it is. Uh, it is actually. I don't know. Nice 18 degrees on my, on my, on my, little, uh, my little weather thing here. It was nice and warm yesterday as well, as opposed to when we met up last week and it was pissing rain. It was about nine degrees. Um, that's in Celsius for you guys that don't know, which is not particularly warm, but no, we're getting there. We're getting to spring. Spring started. We're getting the warmer weather coming in, King. It's looking nice outside my window. And we are getting into fantasy basketball season. Some news that did just drop today. Montrez Harrell has signed with the Philadelphia 76ers to be their backup center. I'm going to go ahead and assume that you're going to say he's not a draftable guy in 12-team leagues, um, unless you have something extra to add to that. No, I don't. No, I I wouldn't be drafting him. I think it's it's a shame for Paul Reed. I thought Paul Reed had had some nice deep league value this season. So cuts into that a little bit. Um, I'd say cuts into it nearly all of it, to be honest. Well, we, we know who we know we know what Doctor Rivers is all about, and he's going to play the bloke that he loved back when he was with the Clippers. Yeah, he is, and, and but it still doesn't. Yeah, I wouldn't be drafting him unless unless we get an injury or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't. Hopefully, people have seen enough from from on, uh, Montrez last season to know that you shouldn't be targeting him. Yeah, but people will still get like, oh man, he's a bucket. He's a six man of the year winner. What if Embiid gets hurt? People will still do it. Don't do mm. it. That's that's yeah, that's our advice there. Now we we both did a mock draft yesterday, Kingy with um, Mitch Casey from the Ball Boys. You can see that whole mock draft over on his channel, and I believe that for some reason my audio was stuffed up. I don't know what happened, so I apologize for the poor quality of my audio on that. We were both in that mock draft. Anything interesting that you thought came out of that draft? Oh, no, not not really. Um, it, it seemed to be a pretty knowledgeable bunch uh, in there. Um, I was pretty happy with my team. Uh, we we talked about it. Uh, we had our first episode of the Clutch Time podcast, Beat Up, and I did a, a mock draft uh, yesterday. And we talked a little bit about that, that draft. And, and for me, I, I seem to get pick four in every draft. Um, three drafts in a row I've had pick four. So... I actually went with Harden at pick four, which was probably a little bit early than he's been going, but um, I was no, okay I to build fine. around him at pick four. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fine. I ended up with Durant at five, and I hate those mid picks. Just on the way back around in a fourteen team league, it was wasn't great. I'd rather be at the top two, top three, or you know, eleven through twelve or yep. eleven through fourteen in this situation. Didn't like that pick, and usually I really like the middle picks. I just don't like it for what is there in the first round, and then what is there in the second round is a bit iffy around that area. But you can go check that out on Mitch's channel, Ball Boys NBA. Go check out. 
I think Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball, maybe, or whatever it is. You can just search Ball Boys NBA or Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball. You will find his channel, and you will uh, be able to check out that mock draft that me and Kingy both did yesterday. And we asked for some questions. We are going to get to one of the players that you really like, who you've taken in both of these mock drafts that you may have been in recently. We'll talk about him later on in the show. But we do have questions come through here from a bunch of Twitter followers. First one is from John Alves. That is for you, John Alves. He said, by season's end, Torres Halliburton, Hall- Torres Halliburton will be a top X player. Where do you think Halliburton will finish? Because he was ranked at 29 on Yahoo initially. He's coming in. He's coming in. He's, he's got a chance. And he went really early in that mock we did yesterday. I think there's going to be a risk of him either going too high and people buying too much into it, or there are plenty of people who just don't believe it all. Go, no way I'm taking him in the top two rounds. So where do you think he's going to fit? Uh, look, I am I was a, a little uncertain probably a month ago. Um but you're sort of digging into his stats a, a little bit. I mean, he finished he finished last year in the, the second round, I think. Pull it up. Yeah, 22nd. It's pretty close to it, yeah. Yeah, 22nd last season. Um, so, I mean, you, you'd, you'd pretty much have to consider that his floor, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so, back into the second round. Based on what we've seen in our mocks over the last couple of weeks, he's going around the turn or around that 12, 13 yep. sort of range. Yeah. Um, which I think he's fine. I'm not sure how much better he can be than that. I, I think that's probably almost his peak value there. But uh, if you're punning points, I think he probably gains uh, a bit of value there because he's probably not going to crack 20 points a game. Uh, maybe maybe he'll go close. But So I think if you're punting, um, that's he's probably sort of a top eight, top seven player. But I think come season's end, he'll be he'll be borderline first round for me. Yeah, look, I think yeah, if we break it down like on a per-game basis, he's probably not a top 12 guy, but you're going to have guys like Davis, LeBron, Kawhi, Kyrie, where you have, we have injury concerns about those guys, and we don't at this point with Halliburton. And you know, while Kyrie, there's nothing theoretically stopping him from playing games, we know there's always a risk there. LeBron has had big injuries in two of the last three years. Kawhi is going to miss, you'd say, minimum 15 games through the back-to-back issue. So yeah, I think if you're getting him at Halliburton at 12 to 14, it's about right, but he might finish 15th or 16th on a per game basis, but you're just banking in a little bit more of perhaps some reliability or at least not missing those 15 games, What you're going to get as a default with Kawhi Leonard. Do you think he can make an all-star game this season? I, I don't. I think it'll be tough. Um, just, uh, I think it will come down to where the pace is set. Um, in the standings a little bit as well. They do tend to go with, with players on better teams. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's a chance, but I probably wouldn't put my money on it. You're going to have guys like, as guards, yeah, Levine, Trey, Van Vliet, Lamello, um, Mitchell, Garland. Um, I'm sure there's plenty more that I'm missing and people are going to be screaming at me. There's a lot of guys who are going to... Harden, Kyrie, um, Jalen Brown. There's so many guys who are ahead of him. I think it's almost going to be impossible for him to be an all-star with all of those Cade Cunningham, all of those Eastern Conference guys who are going to be battling, if not clearly ahead of him uh, at this point for that position. So I, I really don't think that's... Or, you know, DeJounte Murray, like, don't think he's going to make it, but he's in that mix alongside Tyrese Halliburton as well. As an Eastern Conference guard, really don't think that that is going to be um, something that happens. We've got more questions coming in just a sec, but I, I really need something right now, and it's a Bilt Bar, because Bilt Bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. And I actually had a Bilt Bar this morning just to get myself ready for this show, but they've got a new flavor. And if you haven't tried it, you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. It is their cookie dough chunk puff. Covered like all of the bars in 100% real chocolate. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, it's healthy for you. You know what, Kingy? I should have brought you some Built Bars when we met up last week. That would have been probably one of the highlights of your year, I'd say, if I had uh, slipped a couple of those across the table. But if you are not living in Australia, if you're in the United States or Canada, you can just order them. You can go straight to Built.com and get these low-calorie, low-fat, low-sugar, high-protein bars. And you can get them for 15% off. So go to Built.com. Use the code LOCKEDON15. It's a new code, LOCKEDON15. And that'll save you 15% off your order. Built Bar is, of course, built different. All right, next question. This question comes from, going to get the names right on these ones, Flyby Fantasy NBA. He says, how do competitive versus non-competitive teams affect the fantasy player? So Rob Williams on the Celtics versus Yucca Pertle on the Spurs. In other words, do you prioritize certain players based on how competitive the team they play for is? Do you care about that? 
Uh, a little bit, but not too much. Um, and I think it, it, that's something to factor in, obviously, but I think you need to actually look at whether that player playing makes a difference. So like a, a player like um, like Lowry Markinen, for example, for this upcoming season, now playing with Utah, people he's he's shooting up the the ADP and rankings and that sort of thing. But people are sort of saying, well, well are they just going to shut him down at the end of the season because the Jazz don't want to win games? And you sort of, well, perhaps, but also is he actually going to make a difference to them winning games come that time of the year? Because he's not actually that, I mean, he's a good player, but he's not a difference maker. No. Um, and so, yeah, look, I mean, it is something I might factor in slightly, but I don't look at it too much. There would have been people last season, Kingy, that would have said, I'm not drafting Darius Garland because the Cavs will be bad and they'll just shut him down at the end of the season. Um, there'll be people who went like, let's, yeah, we'll grab Pacers players. They'll, they'll be solid. They'll make the playoffs. Yeah, Malcolm Brogdon's healthy and those guys got hurt. Like Damian Lillard, the safest guy we could have. And then they just tanked the shit out of everything. So while it's all well and good, it's just adding an extra thing where you're trying to predict what's going to happen where you just don't know, to be honest. Like, okay, Houston's probably bad. Orlando's probably bad. Utah and San Antonio are probably bad. Like we know that, but one of them might not be. Um, Houston might jump up, Orlando might jump up. It happens every year where someone comes out of nowhere and becomes a really, really good team or someone who was good becomes a bad team due to injuries or due to other circumstances. And while I get the idea of trying, sometimes we try and be too smart or too, too finicky with our decisions and what if this happens or this, just like, just grab the guys, figure it out later on. So much of fantasy is figuring it out as the season goes on as well. And I was, I'm not going to use it as anything more than a you know, third tiebreaker or something when picking players. Yeah, and look, I think that, I mean, that example, the the Pirtle and, and Rob Williams, I mean, you could look at that on, on the other side of the equation and, and are the Celtics going to be right up there in the standings so they'll actually manage Rob Williams and his injuries. Exactly. And, and so, I mean, there's two sides of the coin there. Which one do you look at? And as you said, I think people do overthink it sometimes and, and it's it's better to just take the guys you want and then figure it out if and when uh, a situation like that arises. Yeah, I just I just think sometimes we get too wound up in that. And if you have all these things, well, I'm not taking teams that are too good because they're going to rest guys or too bad, they're going to rest guys. And then because of playoff schedule and because of back-to-backs, you're going to be drafting from a pool of like six teams and you're just not going to be able to do that. And uh, I just like yeah, in this one, we take Rob Williams because he's a much better player than Yucca Pertle for fantasy. That's irrespective of teams that they play for. So I'm not putting a huge amount of focus on that. And here's another one that I think Maybe we overthink it somewhat, Kingy, and that's talking about a finals hangover, which is going to apply or allegedly apply to the uh, Celtics or to the Warriors this is from John Bozar. So this is finals hangover a thing. Should we knock the Warriors players down a few spots because of it? I don't think that you're going to see reduced performances necessarily from Warriors or Celtics players because they played that extra little bit of time. Like we didn't see decreased performances really from Devin Booker or Chris Paul or Mikael Bridges or Giannis or Drew Holiday or anything like that really last season, even though they played that um, yeah, long off season and they've had the Olympics. While the Warriors might be a little bit more cautious because these guys are old, so you might get a little bit more of resting on back-to-backs for Draymond, Clay, and Steph. I think they'll rest some back-to-backs. I don't think it's enough where I look at it as a massive downtick in production and they're going to be playing 29 minutes a night, nothing extreme like that. It just might be one minute fewer per game. It might be three fewer games over the course of the season. And again, not something that I look at as a gigantic impact in drafting. Yeah, no, I actually pulled up, um, when I saw we were going to talk about this question, I actually pulled up the Bucks games um, or, or Bucks player ranks from last season and, and going through the sort of the, the players that actually matter on their squad, outside of Brooke Lopez, obviously, because he was injured, um, yeah. meaning Bobby Portis played a few more games than he, than he may have. Pretty much all of them played around 65, 66 games. Um, and as you said, the Warriors... Um, a little bit older, so Draymond uh, Curry, they may sort of manage them a little bit close, a little bit, uh, a little bit more. But Clay's not even thirty yet, I don't think. No, he's, um, no, he's definitely thirty. He's like thirty-one. Oh, is he? I let, thought let he me, was only. Let me double check that before I make sure I'm not talking out of my ass. Clay Thompson is thirty-two and a half. There you go. Oh, a lot older than I thought. There mm. you go. So maybe him as well. Um, but. Yeah, look, it's I, I don't really factor that in too much. I think I think I did rough calculations, and the average games played last season was mid sixties. Yeah, across 60, the league, sixty six so, or sixty seven or something like that. 
yeah, and the Bucks players were right there, 66, 67. So, yeah, again, I think that's probably overthinking it a bit. Agree. All right, next question comes through from Julian Donovan. It says, how much do you care about positional diversity in your first few picks? Example, if you go for two wings as your first picks, do you then favor a guard or a center in round three, um, even if another wing is higher on your board? Uh, oh, look, I mean, there's a lot of layers to a question like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, depends on format, depends on league settings, depends on your strategy, your build. Um, as I've shown in, in multiple drafts, I'm okay to take three guards with my first three picks um, if that's what I'm building towards. I, I probably do fall into the trap of then having to draft a centre in pick 10, uh, round 10 and, and and reaching a little bit like I did with Bobby Portis in one of those mocks that we did. But yeah, look, if, if I'm punting, I'm okay to lean into it. Um, in a roto format, maybe not quite as much. Uh, and, and then you've got those weird leagues that have two centres or... Um, you need a sort of a specific number of, of players at each position. And, and so you do need to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, but then you also need to, I like it when, when leagues will have, um, so the mock draft we did yesterday, we got to the last pick and I think I, I hadn't drafted a center mm. and I wasn't sure whether it was going to force me to draft a center with my last pick. I took Ricky Rubio, I think, uh, and it didn't. It, it just added him as an extra bench spot. So I like if if your league has those positional requirements of you need a centre, you need a power forward, but it doesn't actually force you to draft those picks because chances are your last three picks, you may end up dropping them anyway and you can grab someone off waivers um, and positional eligibility changes, uh, that sort of thing. So for me, I don't worry too much about it generally, but that's because I punt a lot. It's another thumbs down for the ESPN draft system because that's exactly what they do. If you haven't drafted that position, it will force you to draft the center Mm. with your last pick or a point guard with your last pick. You will have no option, which I think is pretty ridiculous because, again, if I want to run without that position, I can run without it for the first couple of days and see what comes up and see if eligibility changes. But, you know, that lack of flexibility is really frustrating. I'm with you. I'm looking more at the scarcity of particular categories rather than positions. Yeah. And I go, well, I've got two point guards. Now I need a center. So what do I actually care about blocks? Can I grab someone later on? Are the centers all running off the board now? Are the point guards running off the board? Are the assists running off the board? Like, where do I need it rather than like, well, I've taken a shooting guard. So the next pick must be a power forward. Then it must be a point guard. I do like to fill out in general, my starting group, my top 10 in, in a standard league versus getting the bench guys. But if I grab a bench guy, one bench guy before I grab or fill out the starters, I don't actually mind too much. But I do generally like to grab my first 10 in whatever order that fill out those active starting spots. But I don't, like some people will be like, I want to fill out all my starting spots and then I'll fill out my flex and then I'll fill out my bench. I don't care about that. I will grab everything and then fill out the flex and then add a power forward with my last or my 10th pick and then fill out the bench. But I I don't actually mind if we go through and and grab a bench guy before I fill out that starting group. It's not a hard and fast rule um, necessarily with that. Kingy. This next question was really interesting because I've never heard of it before, but Sal offers, offers big questions all the time here for us. He's a good question guy. He's a, he's a really locked in fantasy guy. And Sal says, what are your thoughts on trades that go through instantly in a daily changes league versus a commission approving it at weekend? Have you seen that trades going through instantly affects competitive integrity? One guy prepares for you, then you do a trade and change the matchup. Now, I have never King, heard of a league where trades go through and they all wait and get processed at the end of the week in a daily change. In a weekly league, that, that's what happens. Your trades go through, they process, and they don't carry on to your roster until the next week because lineups are already set. I've never heard this being a thing in a daily changes league where whatever trade you have during the week doesn't doesn't uh, reflect on your roster until the following week. I've never heard of that. I've never had a problem with that affecting competitive integrity. Um but I'm interested to hear your thoughts because I literally was never something that I even thought would have been a problem or I'd ever heard of happening. Yeah, no, I haven't come a- haven't come across it. It's an interesting question though because I, I mean I could see that that would potentially happen. I just don't think I'm in <laughs> I'm in leagues where trades happen often enough that that Same. matters. Um, yeah, I mean I've been through seasons where there's no trades mm-hmm. uh, and. Yeah, I mean, for all my leagues, I just have commissioner approves and I generally just approve them when they come through. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I could, I guess I could see if there was a team, if it was a, 
Well, generally, I mean, if you're in the finals, you shouldn't be doing trades anyway. Come the, the playoffs, we we end no, trades that for sure. before yep. that. So so that wouldn't matter. But during the regular season, if you're going to be trading players to um, sort of, I guess, build your squad and build work on strengths and that sort of thing, then you're going to be trading almost every week because you're going to be up against teams that have different strengths and different weaknesses. And if you're going to be trading players to to bolster your um, production in certain categories on a week-to-week basis, um, I would think the league would catch on and, and sort of, I mean, you've got to then find trade partners every week that are willing to do that as well. So I can see that it, it might be a concern, but I mean, much like you, I haven't come across it in any of my leagues. Yeah, I don't really see like how often that's going. As you said, like, is this a problem that's happening every week? Like, you're not you're not making 25 trades a year. I wouldn't have thought. Um, it might happen once, and you go, "Oh, that's a bummer that this guy got this player in." But what's the difference between trading a player in versus getting someone off the waiver wire that impacts the matchup? I, I don't see the difference in that. If you're worried about that, that's why I think you you would have a weekly league set up. And if it's like, "Oh, well, you know, someone's done this guy a favor and he's traded him, and then they trade him back after the week," well, that's collusion. You kick those guys out. That's simple as that. Because yeah, that can happen. Hey, if you give me this guy for this week, then I'll send him back to you next week. Um, that's collusion. It's cheating. You see you later. That's like. That's something you don't you know, stand for as a commissioner in a league. So I, I don't really see it as a problem, Sal, but it is something, again, I'd never even thought of. So I wanted to bring it up and see if anyone else had any thoughts on that. Now, Kingy, that brings us, we've talked to Mitch. We talked to Dan Besbris a couple of weeks ago about players that they like. Dan was talking up Brandon Clark. Mitch was talking up Jabari Smith. And you're going to hear talk up Devin Vassell, who's a guy that I really like. I thought he went a little bit late in his uh, draft year. He had some moments last season. He was a top 90 player over the last 25 games of the season, playing 31 minutes a night um, and did that only on, like it wasn't like he was getting two steals and that's one of his strong categories, 1.2 steals. He averaged 14 points and now we lose to Jonte Murray. He was ridiculously ranked at like 260 on Yahoo. They have brought him way into 95, which yeah, that's what happens when I talk about how ridiculous it is that he was ranked so low. He is right in now. Um, I actually, like some of these guys that came in, Shingun and Keldon Johnson and Franz Wagner, I think they've come into about the right area. I still think there's value in Vassell at 95, but I put this out on my Instagram yesterday. People are like, no way. Why would I take him at 95? That's way too high. This guy came off the bench. I'd rather have RJ Barrett ahead of him, someone said. Um, so talk us, yeah, and you pissed me off by taking him in a mock draft the other day. We seem to be equally high on Vassell. How high do you think he can get? Uh, yeah, look, in, in terms of where I... I I see him ending the season. I think he could be top 50. Um, and yeah, he is, he is slowly coming up. I think I got him in the draft yesterday as well. You did possibly. Yeah. Me, me and Mitch um, talked about that. Yeah. So it's, yeah, look, I, I just really like, I mean, opportunity is obviously the, the key word here um, with DeJounte Murray uh, not there. And I think if people sort of remember back to last season, Vassell was hyped a little bit. He was a bit, inconsistent, especially in terms of his scoring, uh, playing time. But down the stretch, he was he was solid without doing anything outlandish. Um, his usage wasn't super high. It was like um, 19. Yeah. So, so I think you take DeJounte out of there. And I know there were a few games that he played where DeJounte wasn't there, but it was only a handful. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge sample size. Um, his usage, I mean, it, it's going to go up. But it's not. He's not one of those guys where his usage needs to go up to twenty five or twenty six for him to have no. value. So get, get it to twenty two and it's you're fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as you said, he was he he steals a sort of, I guess one of his biggest strengths. Um, he could get those potentially to one point five, one point six. Agree. Um, he's he's not a terrible shot blocker from the guard position. So I think getting to two combined defensive stats is doable. Um, maybe 1.4 and 0.6 or something like that. Uh, and then he'll, he'll hit some threes. Uh, he's efficient from the line. He's scoring. I mean, he's, he's offensive production last season. He would have games where he would just go one of 10 um, and score three points or four points. That should slowly phase out of his game as he's got the ball in his hands a little bit more. And I think we saw as well, um, again, down the, the stretch there where he was playing a bit more, he actually had a few games, a handful of games where he had five or six assists. And so I think that's an element of his game that, that might um, just increase as well. He might, he might be able to get to three and a half or four assists per game. 
down the stretch, his final 10 games, which a lot of those were without DeJounte Murray, who was out with a fake wrist injury. Um, I, I believe it was a wrist injury during that time. His last 10 games, he averaged almost 16 points with three threes, four and a half boards, two and a half assists, 1.6 steals on 42 from the field, uh, 90 from the line, and 44 from three. And the 44 from three will come down. He's you know, six, but 16, that's a top 80 player, right? And he was doing that in 31 minutes, bumped that to 32, 33, give him a couple of extra shots per game. Um, yeah, that was 20 usage. Maybe it's 21 usage. I, I think the top, I wouldn't take him in the top 50, but no. 95 is great value. I, I still think, yeah, around 80, 70 in competitive drafts if you need to get into round, you know, the back end of round five, start of round six. No, no problem with it. Like, I think he's going to start. I think he's guaranteed 30 plus minutes. And I think that we, what we saw from down the stretch is almost, well, not, a, not a baseline because again, 44% from three of those last 10 games isn't real. But he did shoot like 39% over the course of the season. And he's a good shooter. He's a good defender. He's going to have the ball a little bit. It's his third season. He's getting more comfortable in the system. I'm, I'm really, really in on him. And I think that that ADP and rank will start to come in even more as the season goes on. Uh, it'll get to a stage where I don't want to take him if he, if he's, mm. he gets re-ranked at 48 or something, which I think is possible. I'll say, I don't, I don't know about that. But you're right. Top 50 is absolutely like... Uh, if he he could easily average nineteen six and three and a half with one point seven steals, and that's a top thirty player, right? That's yeah. not an outrageous expectation for him. It's top end, but it's not it's not insane. It's not like me saying I expect Drew Eubanks to average twenty and ten with three blocks. Like mm. which you, get, you know you're a dickhead. What are you talking about? Nineteen six and three and a half with one point five steals is totally reasonable. I think for Vassell. Yeah, yeah, no. Look, I think, and and I mean, we've seen still it, it's starting to to level out, but I, we're seeing Kelvin Johnson go ahead of him in drafts. I actually mm-hmm. prefer it the other way. I'd take Vassell over Kelvin Johnson. I think Kelvin um, will score more. So the the yeah. relative scarcity of points might might I I I'd debate it. Like I'd be, and I think Kelvin's going to go higher than most. So I, there's a possibility he could get both of those guys in back to back rounds, and just that scarcity of points maybe pushes Kelvin a little bit ahead. But I get what you're saying. Yeah, he. W- I think he will score more, um, but well, based on what we've seen anyway last season. But um, yeah, I'm okay taking Vassell. And and I mean, while we don't really consider turnovers and don't worry about them, if it is a category that you're looking at and you're just trying to to be steady enough, Vassell doesn't turn the ball over a lot, um, which, which is for for a player that will have the ball in his hands a little bit more. He probably um, he probably will turn over a little bit more this season. Yeah, yeah, but he's not he's not going to be sort of three or four turnovers per game. He'll probably be under two. So, um, yeah, that, that's sort of just a, an added bonus for anyone that actually cares about turnovers. I think there's a lot of people who do draft in leagues that look at things where, look, this is what he did last season and, and then don't realise, you know, like the, the opportunity in San Antonio, in Utah, in Indiana is going to be really interesting for guys like Vassell and Keldon Johnson. Jalen Smith, potentially Isaiah Jackson, potentially Colin Sexton and Larry Market in Utah. They just look at what they did last season and go, no, nah, I'm not taking those guys. But much like DeJounte Murray, who went from 21 usage to 28 last season when DeMar DeRozan was gone and went from a guy who was a pretty good player to everyone now anointing him as like this you know, five-time future all-star legendary player when he literally wasn't that guy at all before last season. Like opportunity is going to be presented because someone has to take shots. Someone has to handle the ball and... There's not that many options on the team. No, that's right. Um, I mean, their depth chart, if you look at um, at the shooting guard position, it's Vassell and then it's what Josh Primo, maybe. Um, Langford's there, Malachi Branham. L- L- um, Langford, mate, it's, he's, oh, he's, he's bad. <laughs> um, Doug McDermott's still there, Josh Richardson. Um, so they're, they're, they're front court. They've got a little bit more. Uh, but in their backcourt, sort of out on the wings, there's there's not much. So it's a lot of young players um, who haven't proven themselves at all. So I think Vassell, Trey Jones, they're both going to be logging um, pretty heavy minutes. I agree. It's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out. Kingy, one final thing. Victor Wembanyama measured in at seven foot four today with no shoes on with an eight foot wingspan. So, yeah, wow. he's, uh, he's, he's, he's 18. So we'll see what happens with that. That's just something interesting that came across the timeline today. Kingy, tell people what you've got going on over at uh, Fantasy Basketball International. Uh, yeah, so we've got, uh, as I said, we, we had our first episode of the Clutch Time podcast yesterday. We did a, a live mock draft um, with uh, 12 of our uh, uh, um, listeners, readers, um, 
so that's going to be a regular thing. Uh, we've got a regular uh, AMA or mailbag show as well that, that I'll just be doing as I feel necessary. So whenever there's enough news out there that, that I can talk about stuff. Um, and then coming into the season where we've got a few other things uh, in the pipeline, looking at doing a, a box score breakdown or something like that, um, a post-game show, um, and maybe even something live during the games as they're happening, um, depending on time and, and what I've got available. Um, and then, and I think we're, we're hoping that Matt uh, Lawson will be uh, launching his Dynasty podcast as well in, in the next week or two. Um, so stay tuned for that one. Let's go check out the stuff that Kingy and Matt and b are doing over at uh, Fantasy Basketball International. It's fbi-basketball.com is the website. There's a lot of Dynasty stuff over there as well. Adam, thank you for coming on the show and, uh, and chatting with me. No worries, mate. Uh, fun as always, and we'll talk again soon. And that will do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. If you are here on YouTube, you know what to do. Thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.